As Lauren said, my name is Peter Bowman. I'm the Chief Executive of Active Nav. For those of you that don't know us, we're the experts in uh, data discovery, specifically around uh, the world of unstructured data and providing you a whole bunch of proven workflows and tools, whether it be to remediate, quarantine, find sensitive PII uh, in line of regulatory requirements and, and alike. Um, we've got a brilliant discussion coming up today, obviously surviving the data explosion, specifically around uh, the elephants in the room, i.e. unstructured data. Uh, we'll be talking about a few practical steps that uh, can be used to manage this, this kind of exponential growth. And uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll try and give you some tips and uh, you know, some approaches you can actually take away today, um, particularly if you're, you're stuck with trying to get over the inertia and, and get, uh, get a program or project moving uh, within your respective organizations. Um, we'd like to interact with you uh, as much as we like to interact with our data. So as Lauren said, please do ask questions and uh, I'll, I'll try and multitask and uh, run the panel, uh, which is fantastic. I'll introduce them shortly. And at the same time, look at your, your questions and try and catch the ones which I think I think reflect the, uh, the broader audience as well. So please do ask questions uh, as, as you feel appropriate. Um, and here's the format for today. So uh, I'll just uh, pass over to each of our panelists today, let them introduce themselves. I'll, I've got a few questions to kind of kick things off. And uh, we may go through all my questions or we may stop and just uh, grab your questions. Uh, we're, we're pretty relaxed. Uh, they're an extremely knowledgeable panel. I'd hate to say that we've got about 80, 90 years experience between us because that would uh, that would age uh, me more than them. Uh, but I think we probably have. And so, uh, Lauren, if we could introduce maybe uh, Brittany first, uh, Brittany Roosh. Hello, Brittany. Hi. Um, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Peter. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Brittany Roush, a director at the Cripsis Group, which is now Palo Alto Networks. I lead our data analytics service line, which focuses on post data breach notification, uh, structured data analysis, and using technology to manage data privacy and information governance needs. I've spent most of my career innovating technology to solve data privacy problems and developing solutions to manage cyber and litigation risk. I began my career in the federal government where I worked for the Department of Defense, the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the FBI before moving on to navigate consulting in the private sector. Uh, most recently, I was at a technology startup prior to coming to Cripsis. Um, so I'm looking forward to diving into this important topic with my very impressive panelists. Brittany, thank you very much. You've got a phenomenal CV, uh, resume, uh, Brittany. I'm sure we're all in awe of you. You've got a combination of government, commercial, startup, cyber, e-discovery, you know, litigation, etc. So uh, hope, hopefully some really uh, pertinent questions will come through. Thank, thanks, Brittany. If uh, we could get Kayla on the line as well, please. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Kayla Williams. I'm the Director of Governance, Risk, and Compliance for LogMeIn, the makers of LastPass and GoToMeeting, as long as other uh, SaaS products that help you work remotely from home. Um, my experience has been uh, very varied, uh, not quite as impressive as Brittany's, in my opinion. I think she's got a great uh, CV here. Um, but I started uh, doing external audits for municipalities around Massachusetts and then moved into internal audit for small banks and credit unions within the state of Massachusetts as well. And then I moved over into internal audit for a number of years inside a financial services organization. From there, I actually moved into information security consulting due to my vast experience in assurance work. Um, at that time, I moved over to the UK and continued working there uh, for information security uh, consultancy and moved into uh, global program management for the security and then enterprise risk management function. From that, I moved over to LogMeIn and I became the director of governance, risk and compliance. And you know, it's, it's a portfolio of about 23 different products that service millions of people around the world. So we are very much impacted by the global privacy uh, landscape and <laughs> how much it changes impacts us as well. So um, I'm really interested in having this conversation with everybody and please feel free to ask us questions as we go along. Yeah, that's great. So look, anyone that's lived in the UK might have a chance to understand any poor jokes that they can <laughs> Um, and also, Kayla, I, I guess, uh, given your business and that their expertise remote working, are you, are you one of those counter cyclical businesses in the last uh, nine months or so during COVID that uh, you've seen a, a, a scary uh, growth rate? Uh, 
compared to some? Yeah, absolutely. We have. Um, not only did we have to shift 4,000 of our employees to 100% remote, but we also had to support all of our customers and our free emergency remote working kits that we provided um, to the public because everybody had to, like overnight, had to shift. And um, it's been such an influx um, and a great learning experience for all of us. But it's been uh, it's been interesting. It's been a wild ride, I have to say. <laughs> on the inside of a company that's supported by other companies on the outside. So I'm sure yeah. you're good. Thank, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, finally, if we could also bring uh, Jamie onto the uh, the panel now. Hello, Jamie. Hi. Uh, quick intro, please. Sure, Peter. Thank you. Um, so I have over a decade of legal and business experience, really serving in a variety of different positions, all though focused on supporting innovation through the responsible use of data and technology with the large majority of that experience at a Fortune 500 financial services company. Um, on the legal side, I have advised in roles in the law and technology, intellectual property, litigation, um, commercial litigation, and regulatory advisory areas. Um, most recently, I was part of a small team that was responsible for building a data ethics and privacy program for the company that really focused on setting the strategy, the policy and controls for the collection, use and sharing of personal data. Um, this effort included leadership and governance, operations, third party data sharing initiatives and really that change management um, effort at the enterprise um, international level to really focus on infusing privacy into everything we were doing at the company. Um, throughout the, uh, my career, I have been an active participant in data discovery, e-discovery, classification, retention, privacy by design, and other data uh, governance cross-functional enterprise efforts. So I am looking forward to joining Peter, Brittany, and Kayla um, to today's discussion. I think uh, it, it, it depends to our other panelists today. Your, is Capital One a, it's obviously a Fortune 500, isn't it? You know what number it is in the uh, in the five hundred? Oh. Approximately. So I took quick. I would say um, in the sixties. I'm throwing that out there. I hope I'm right. Top top one hundred uh, American firm. And you've literally been in the thick end, having you right in the thick of it, uh, determine their their governance, their policies, their approach, building out steering committees, getting the internal uh, energy and support, which is something we know that a lot of our audience will be struggling with on a on a you know on a day-to-day -day basis but i think having you here and that that experience really is is phenomenal uh, it's great to have you as well thank you Jamie. that's good okay so let me let me kick off with a with a kind of a first uh, question that sets the scene a little bit more um and the question really is how, how do we get here um you know according to most market commentators idc forrester gartner and alike you know, we're all familiar, 80% of the information that we hold in, in our organizations is effectively unstructured, i.e. very, very broad brush sits outside the database environment. And I, I use information carefully here. Um, we, we now call it data, uh, even though it's unstructured, not because it's correct or because we don't get it um, and we'd like to be purists. But the whole market since the advent of cyber and InfoSec joining into the records group, uh, everyone calls things data. And if you start calling information and data, it, it tends to confuse people. But just so the audience doesn't try and call me out on uh, you know, the, uh, the, the perfectionist views between information and data. So I'm going to be referencing information, unstructured information as data throughout this call. So I hope that's okay. So 80% of it is, is effectively unstructured. We usually, most organizations don't know where it is, what it is, who owns it, how much they've got. And that's really remarkable. I mean, it's just unbelievable. In, in here, 2020, never mind COVID, and you know, we're, we're trying to get people operating outside the, the walls of their, their organizations. We don't know what this data is and how much we've got. And every time we ask a customer, uh, so how much have you got? Oh, we've got about you know 174 terabytes. Well, three months later, we'll tell them they've actually got 540 terabytes. It, it's remarkable. It's like the last thing in an organization that people really understand. And, and that's why we're all here today to talk about it. Um, and so uh, it needs to be accessible and it needs to be trustworthy, spinning with it. So I'd like to ask my panel today, uh, in no order, how do you think we got here? You know, what, what, what led us to this, this, this situation? and to, to be so poorly managed and such a core asset to and an expensive asset and a risky asset to organizations. So 
and anyone happy to kick off? Well, how do we get here? Sure, um, I'll jump in uh, real quick. I think there's just more inputs. There's a lot more ways for us to get data this day, these days, whether it's through um, buying and selling that information or scraping it through social media. It's just readily available. And a lot of times people um, and companies, when they start to think about their, their data, it's, it's almost like a monolith. It's something that they go, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start. So you know what, I'm just gonna put it off a little bit longer. And then that, it just starts to compound and it becomes a bigger problem. So in, in my opinion, the, this 80% number is actually, I'm surprised it's not even higher than that, to be honest, to just with the, just the vast number of, of uh, data inputs out there. Uh, Brittany, sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> no, not at all. No, I think that's, that's very valid. And the other aspect too is that, you know, from the perspective of a, a cyber perspective, you know, people don't want to put the money or the resources into it until they've already had a breach and they find that their data is way different than what they've expected. I mean, I've done some somewhere around three or 400 breaches over the last two years and every single matter, you know, th there's just a big shock value in what's actually in the data. Um, and the resources are limited. You know, there's only one person that's a privacy officer, if they're even lucky enough to have a privacy officer. You know, they don't know that the technology exists to automate these workflows. Or if the technology does exist, it, it's usually sometimes more expensive than what they're willing to put into, you know, cataloging and managing that data. So there's a lot of different factors, but oftentimes it's a very reactive kind of a, a way of approaching things. So, 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 um, uh, statement there, um, and our own experience is at, at the point of a breach, then you know all hell uh, lets loose. Um, it's remarkable, funds are found, uh, the smartest people in the business get involved, um, and I think we all get that. It's a little bit late, um, however, it, it's uh, it, it's understandable. It's unfortunately it's a human nature thing how we often react, isn't it? We, we know the house has got a problem, we don't deal with it until it's fallen over, kind of thing. Um, from your perspective, Jamie, how do we how do we get ahead of that? You know, how, how do you how, how do you energize and motivate the the executive level to recognize they need to get in control prior to the breach? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I've, I've been involved in a lot of change management efforts that involve um, you know bringing an entire company, which starts with the executives with us on this journey. Um, you know. Privacy and security are certainly not new topics for executives um, or the company as a whole, but there there hasn't always been this increased emphasis we're seeing from regulators, media, consumers at that international level. So um, really working with the leaders to set this expectation that a culture mindset uh, shift is needed to really appropriate uh, appreciate that broad scope of data that's protected by these laws that needs to be protected at the company. Um, also appreciating that people have that varying level of knowledge. Um, when we think about unstructured data specifically, for example, you know, people may not be aware of what kind of data falls within this category. I mean, it's such a broad scope. And so even though well-intentioned when you're getting your leaders to get on board and help people get excited about protecting their data, you know, they, they may have that well intention, but they may um, not know to include everything in their effort. So there really is this education aspect. You'll probably hear me repeat myself about that throughout this um, that's necessary for that core understanding and appreciation so that you can even take the right steps to make that progress. So it's a question to the three of you. Um, in absence of a breach, um, which is hopefully a good place for an organization to be, what, what do you think the, the hottest second incentive is today to do something, and the ob the obvious candidates being things like you know regulatory uh, you know requirements such as CCPA, GDPR, whatever they may be. But what 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 do you believe is the second uh, you know greatest incentive to get people off their uh, their backsides? Um, I actually think that the the second best incentive is accountability. If you can actually say who owns the data and who's responsible for ensuring that it's protected the appropriate way, you're not going to get in trouble for something that's going on. <laughs> so um, I know that that sounds really selfish, but I look at it as, you know, being in GRC, people all automatically assume that it's our responsibility to protect all 
the data across the organization. I'm sure you all can relate to that as well. When, when really it's the information owner or the information custodian who really should be you know, in charge of the security controls and, and the technical privacy controls that are put in place to, to mitigate the risk. Security is everybody's responsibility and security does fall into all of these privacy requirements uh, on the back end, obviously with the, the delineation between security and privacy, but it's absolutely um, an accountability uh, perspective to me. I think that's a great incentive to get people to, uh, to put in the effort. Here, here, definitely. Brittany, anything uh, magical to to add here, or should I move on? All right. Well, I, I think the the other thing too is legal risk. You know, we we talk about this a lot in the the cyber framework, but this all came about you know years ago with e discovery and managing legal risk. And you know, the less data that you retain, the less data you have when there's you know litigation that comes up. And if you can get rid of the data before the litigation you have less to respond with. So there's a lot of incentives from a, a monetary perspective, um, especially because if you have that that cyber breach and then it goes to litigation, now you have a double whammy of you know monetary uh, uh, risk that you have to deal with. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah, thanks, thanks guys. I know we could spend a whole hour just talking about that one, so uh, I'll, I'll move on here. Um, this one seems to align itself quite nicely to your, your background, Jamie, but let, let's see. Uh, many companies collect everything um, they've got uh, about, about consumers, particularly if it's a, a B2C type organization. You know, the, the famous just in case, uh, the number of times that we have taken organizations to the point where they can literally defensively destroy a lot of their data. And you get this conflict in the organization where obviously often the compliance privacy group are supportive even the business is supportive, but general counsel will say, no, don't, don't, don't delete it just in case. And I, and, and the cynic in me is always like, well, who goes to jail? It's probably the, the CEO, not the general counsel. Um, but anyway, you can ignore that. Um, and, um, and, and, and this is you know, kind of in spite of all the new privacy laws, um, four or five years ago, it was almost like understandable. Today, it's no longer understandable. Uh, it's a very dangerous practice, obviously. So how can organizations kind of align different perspectives and balance the risk with kind of value creation in the organization? How, how do they do that? A question to any of you, but feel free, Jamie, if you if you want to grab it first. Sure, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I would just say at a high level, Peter, my advice would be based on two things. One, taking the time to really understand the risk by knowing what you have. Um, and then to managing what you have responsibly throughout the entire data life cycle. Um, there has never been you know, a more important time for organizations to have this comprehensive current view of what the data that they're holding. Um, because for example, this is very basic, but before you can provide someone the data you have on them per regulation, you have to actually understand what data you have on them. Um, and, you know, I, I already gave y'all a warning, but like as part of the inventory process, you know, education, I'm going to go back to it again, is, is critical to ensure that that overview is complete and you're capturing as much as you can, which includes the broad category of unstructured data. So when I say education here, I'll be specific. I'm, I'm referencing topics like, you know, what's included in the category of unstructured data. Um, any terms whose definitions have been expanded by the regulations like personal information or any scope expansions, like including consumers versus a narrow focus on customers. Um, you know, Kayla mentioned it earlier, education on, you know, who owns what and what those responsibilities actually mean to be an owner. And then, you know, people like us that live and breathe this work, we have this baseline knowledge, but it shouldn't be assumed that like the large majority of the organization does, which is who you're working with to make sure you have this complete view. And so, once you have that kind of wrapped around your hands of what we actually have, confirming that you know good privacy practices have been embedded throughout your organization to help mitigate this collect everything I can mindset, which includes um, embracing the concept of privacy by design, for example, with some variation of a privacy impact assessment incorporated into your product, into your tech development processes. This will help people think through things like, what data do I want to collect? Do I really need to collect all that data? Do I need to think about consent? The list goes on. We could spend a whole whole 45 minutes on that as, um, that part alone. But uh, two other things I'll quickly mention, uh, retention schedules. 
um, will help hold people accountable. And I'm also a huge proponent um, after having served in both a legal and a business role of having legal compliance risk groups involved from the very beginning, not from not only a compliance perspective, but also a business perspective. Um, you have the privacy laws. They're really putting that emphasis on the need to be intentional when thinking through what personal information you collect, use and retain. Um, and so retain, requiring that personal information is handled in accordance with the purposes for what it's collected from the beginning is, is a, good, a good thing because you're incorporating these additional people and processes into the overall process. So at first the business may say, wait a minute, you know, this isn't necessarily the positive um, additions I wanna have to a process, but this approach will have extreme value for the business. So communicating that, that it's mitigating the need for redesign if something gets missed. And it's really just pushing us to be smarter and really more thoughtful with how we achieve our business objectives so we can be respectful of the person that is behind the data we are collecting. I would have thrown um, the consumer view um, as an answer to your previous questions on what motivates I, I like that actually, Jamie. So uh, one, one of the takeaways I'll, I'll, I'll take from that, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, the, the bits I understood are education. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, year, years ago, not that long ago, three, four years ago, people created information in the enterprise and they literally didn't care. They didn't care. You know, how many times it was duplicated, how many variations, versions, where it was saved. I can remember some of the stuff I write. I used to write about my customers 25 years ago into Losis Notes. And God forbid it's still out there somewhere. I probably should have shared that, you know, but, uh, you know, Bob, Bob, wife just had a baby. Make sure you mention, you know, really, really sensitive information. People, so we never used to think about it. And now we do. And so I'm interested maybe to, to Brittany and Kayla, um, the, the education, has it become easier, i.e., uh, the workforce now understands, and even the younger workforce understand the sensitivities and the, the danger of holding a lot of PII sensitive information. And is that therefore making, you know, our jobs easier um, to, to actually you, you know, manage it and execute change? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you think about like Gen Z and, you know, I'm a millennial, so, you know, I can you know talk about millennials with some authority that, you know, we care more about data privacy because we've had our information on the internet for most of our lives. And so we're aware that it's there. We're aware of how it gets transmitted. And so, you know, I think about, I have a there's a person on, on our team who's like 22, 23, something like that. And he knows all about retention policies, all about e-discovery, because he just doesn't want his data stored. And like, that's that's remarkable to me. You know, when I was 22, I, I didn't have any concept of any of this. So I, I think there's just an awareness that's gonna continue to build over the years. And as we see more and more like millennials going into these senior executive positions, there's gonna be a bigger focus on it. Um, or at least I hope so, because it's really important and, you know, it helps a lot if the, the whole company is invested in, in that work. That's good. It's good to have a millennial on the call as well, Brittany. Keep, keep, us, uh, keep us honest. Uh, Kayla, anything you'd like to add to that this point? Um, actually, I agree with Brittany on that. I think that um, the youth, as they say, are just more aware of what's going on because not only has the technology been there, but they've also seen the the reputational damage, the harm that can be caused yeah. to their peers, um, never mind the companies, but their peers, when something happens to them um, or even their family through through a breach, it's, it's just been around, it's been more prevalent um, through their upbringing. And I really think that that's what leads them to be more aware of, the, of their rights as an individual data subject. I think, I think that's a lot. And, and so if, if this is really the case, and you won't get it all all the uh, the youth, uh, if you like, coming through that way. I can think of my own children. I've got one that's got everything out there everywhere. And the other one, who, uh, strangely enough, is actually doing a law degree, um, has got it all locked down. He doesn't want to put anything out on any social, uh, you know, outlets kind of thing. And so, but if, if it's maybe that, it could just be a cyclical thing. We could find the generational thing. We're, we're still of the generation where, whoa, we're all networked. We're all communicating. Oh, now we've got to start putting control. Maybe in 10 years time, there'll be a natural evolution uh, coming through the workforce of people recognizing the need for uh, you know, privacy, um, which would be nice, wouldn't it? Although it might make us all redundant. So you've got to be careful, you wish for. Um, so actually, the question's just come in. I think we've touched it, but let's uh, let's just see. Um, what is the most common mistake in managing unstructured data? So let's be 
fair to our audience? That's the question that's just popped in. Anybody want to have a, a crack at that? Uh, the most common mistake in managing unstructured data. Yeah, I can I can take a crack at it. Um, I think what I see a lot is that you know, well-meaning organizations will go through all of the work to categorize their data, figure out where it is. They they build the taxonomy, they set the retention policies, but then they don't enforce it. And so what happens is data gets sent in you know against the policies. They have a breach, and all of a sudden that data is out there, even though you know they had strict requirements not to do that. Um, and there's many tools to do that enforcement. There's Active Nav, there's Office 365, there's other, you know, data mapping tools that are out there that, you know, flag those things and create that automation. So it's not even really difficult to do the enforcement, but that's the, the key piece. And I, I think that's where Jamie's education really comes in is because if they know that's available, then that, that's the way to solve that problem. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. I also feel that the data governance and protection is really one of the main pillars of an identity and access management program. And going along with that, you know, um, curbing the risk in, in this area really can come down to doing access recertifications. Is it really appropriate for, you know, for me to have access into a financial services, uh, you know, the back end of, of, um, of an invoicing system if I'm working in, you know, GRC or, you know, in HR and being able to remove the inappropriate access will really help to curb that risk, the likelihood that something's going to happen. I mean, the impact would still be relatively high if it's going to be uh, PII, but the likelihood of something occurring, especially from a malicious insider uh, actor or someone gaining the credentials of somebody else and being able to move through your network, especially with you know privileged access as well. That's another huge risk there. And in, in ac um, yeah. access recertification as part of an identity and access management program will really help to to um, kind of solve for some of these issues as well. Now it's interesting, Kate. I imagine you're you're kind of you're, as an organisation or experts in that that field. We we see within individual uh, entities and individual one of the problems they've got. They've got the technology for identity access management and, and alike, but the uh, you know the, uh, the the kind of change in scene is just too much. The, there's 40 staff leaving every week and people moving departments, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just so hard for them to track it. Um, and you know, so they often fall over, <clears throat> which means you need, a, you need a combined approach, don't you? You need to know who owns and has access to the data and do the very best you can and probably put more energy in, into that and use the tools that you almost certainly have. But at the same time, recognize that, that you need a fail safe. That won't always work. And therefore, you do also need to be looking at the data. And it's this combined approach, isn't it, that uh, is it, probably the way forward. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. So the way that brings me on some, some preamble I had at the beginning of the session was um, it feels like it's the last taboo or maybe it's the current last taboo in in the corporate uh, world. When I say corporate, I, I, I include you know, federal governments as well. We see it there, which is to delete data. You know, why is it so hard? Why why can't people hit that button? You know, you've got a seven year retention schedule. Oh, this document's nine years. Um, it, it's the seventeenth example of a PowerPoint that uh, was presented four years ago. Um, you know, why can't organisations get over themselves and move on? And you know, I call it the last taboo. Um, certainly around data. And thoughts thoughts on that. Yeah, it's funny. We, you know, we work in this field, right? And we still have our own problems with this. You know, we had to delete some data from Slack and there was a whole, you know, upheaval about this. Um, I thought there was going to be a ride on our hands. And it's, it's just because people are just afraid of losing important data. And, you know, it's that, that kind of hoarding mentality that, that comes up with it. You know, and it it's not even, um, I think, that difficult to do. You know, once it's gone, most people don't realize it's it was ever even there. But um, I, I don't know. There's just this very innate fear around deleting data. And it's 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 quite something. I've dealt with it um, multiple times throughout my career. Do, yeah, and I, I think. Yeah. Is, go ahead, Peter. I was just going to say, maybe, Jamie, and you know, what have you found that actually works? You know, what, how do you, do you get the people in the room and show them the, 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 how ludicrous it is to keep some of this stuff? Uh, you know, how, how do you do it? We, we've, we've worked with companies who've had, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name now, but they've had like, 
you know, kill your day to day when they actually have to remove, you know, 30 percent of, of their data. Obviously, you know, they've already gone through a process to get them into the right place, but they all feel good about it and they get T-shirts and they get, you know, special donuts or whatever it is about kill their day to day. And there's awards to the person that was the most aggressive, uh, but always within the conf confounds of what's what's. You know, being correctly, uh, you know, presented to them. So, Jamie, you know, any experience you've you worked in? You've worked in that uh, Fortune Hundred. You know, how, how did you get rid of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I like the idea of you know the the day to to reward people. I mean, recognition is never a bad a bad um, avenue to go. I, I would say just like going back to the data retention policy. Um, even if you already have one, like that's the accountability piece of it. Like even if you already have one revisiting it regularly to like engage like I'll go to Brittany's group and I will talk to her about what it is and what the categories are and here are the retention really making them think about it I think it's so easy from a broad perspective to say oh I don't want to I want to keep this all of this data um and 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 then you know is a whole group versus getting very specific with the different business and technical groups and then going to Kayla and having the same conversation um just making sure you revisit it so I think that that having that conversation um, to make it real for people. And then also, you know, just making sure that they're understanding the risk um, and then celebrating the success when people have done it and then, um, you know, are still having business success from it. So I think the retention policy is something you can go back to. What, what's your view on the, the, the stick side of this? We're talking about the carrots. Um, we, we have a couple of customers, I'm sure, Brittany, you, 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 you have a few as well, where they've been breached and you know, got themselves into quite a mess. And uh, they've had to introduce a stick uh, policy as well. And f for example, if, you're, um, if you accidentally save password files in, you know, in the wild or in an unprotected uh, fashion, it, it's not a three strike. You're literally out. And uh, you know, we, we've seen examples of that. Do, do you have views on it aside of whether it's fair or not but do you have views on that within your own kind of kind of realm of experience Well, from, from our perspective, um, because we go through so many different security audits, our policies are written to say, you know, hey, you know, if you are found to be willfully negligent, you know, it could be, you know, an HR disciplinary action leading up to and including termination. And, you know, having an, an administrative policy in place doesn't really deter anybody from doing anything. It's more something you can fall back on from a legal perspective. So I really think you have to pair up having technical controls in place that can prevent people from accidentally doing something that could compromise the organization or, or even themselves in their personal life. Um, you know, like I think Brittany mentioned it before and I know Jamie has as well. It's like having technical controls and then the, the accompanying training and awareness just constantly going on, not just like the once a year to tick the box or, you know, on a data privacy day, but having little Slack campaigns or well, when we go back into offices, if we ever do again, having, you know, the audio visual up that just reminds people to practice these good behaviors because it will then translate from their corporate environment and their, their jobs into their personal life. And, and that will help protect them there as well. So it, you don't want to fire somebody or, you know, have something, you know, written up against them because they made a simple mistake and you'll reduce that likelihood if there's constant reminders, even like, hey, like a, a mouse pad could even say like, don't forget, don't use a sticky note for passwords or something, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think it's interesting. And, and, and Brittany, I'm sure you, you've got a lot of experience with your, your customers in this area. You know, it's the whole it's the whole ISO InfoSec security thing, and it goes from clear desk policy um, all, all the way through to what what you do and don't do with your digital content. Uh, any any hot tips from your your experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the the worst days of of any breach is when you know the CISO on the phone says that they have to fire someone for you know letting the password be out in the wild or or what have you and. Um, you know, one of the things that we did in the FBI that I, I wish all organizations would adopt is the email of shame. So once a quarter, they sent out an email that listed out everyone who violated the policies. And usually they were ridiculous stories. It was a great read, but it really created that like cultural <laughs> accountability because yeah. nobody wanted to be on the email of shame. And mm -hmm. I, I think that that's sometimes a much better stick than, you know, just firing someone. But, you know, there's always those exceptions. But, yeah, just, you know, making sure that you're, you're following the policies and, 
you know, keeping your desk clear. Don't save the, the Word document with all of your personal information in it, with every password you've ever had. You know, just, just don't do that. Get a password locker. Um, you know, I think uh, Kayla has LastPass, which is, is great. And, um, you know, use, use the tools that are out there to manage things well so that you're not in that email of shame or, you know, unfortunately getting the pink slip at the end of the day. Yeah, I guess email of shame is better than the pink slip, but I do like the term email of shame. I mean, in, in all our organizations, something I, I live in fear of the whole time as a, as a CEO is somebody just accidentally clicking on the phishing email. And uh, how do you keep people current? You know, how do you keep them fresh, uh, especially when they're on a phone and they're doing something else? And, and uh, any, any tools, I think anything and, and keep changing them is, is, uh, is what I'm hearing here. So we've got another question that's come in. It, it might be for you, Brittany. I don't know. Let's try it out. Uh, what new challenges posed by technology to unstructured data management do you foresee in the next five to 10 years? So it's an interesting question. What new challenges do we uh, think technology is going to bring to the world of unstructured data? I guess proliferation <laughs> would be an obvious one. But Brittany, do you want to have a first crack at it? Yeah, you know, I think about this a lot, and I'm not sure that I have a good answer. I mean, the the problems that we're seeing now aren't new problems. They're problems that we had 10, 15 years ago. And I think that the answer is always the same. It's just if you create an environment where you're always um, responding or building out policies and procedures to handle any kind of risk, so from an emergency management perspective, you know, that all hazard risk approach, then you're going to be able to handle those those challenges in the next five to 10 years. I mean, everything is gonna evolve, but I, I don't know, I just haven't seen much change in the core problems. So that, that's not very insightful, but I also think that, you know, we can solve these problems in the future by solving the problems we have now. J Jamie or K Kayla, a, a viewpoint on this? I think, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, going around the question a little bit, but the, it's going towards, you know, Brittany's point about, you know, we're having the same problems just in bigger volumes and it's going to continue to happen like that. Um, and, and already on this on this panel, we've talked about so many different issues, retention, you know, making sure we have enforcement. And I think one thing we have to keep in mind, if you're the if you're the team that's responsible for managing all of this data governance is really think about your client is the people using, you know, following your policies and using any tools and really having what, well, you know, a product mindset for these people to make it as easy as possible. I mean, I think the question is great in, is in the fact that it illustrates that it's top of mind for everyone that there's going to continue to be this, this huge challenge that we, we will see for years to come. So really thinking about how can we make it as easy as possible for people that are already, you know, have a whole other stack of to do's on their list, on their list um, every day. So just something to keep in mind that when we're throwing things at them, making it as uh, I always go back to the product mindset, just making it a good, solid product for them to use so that everyone can be successful and, and easy as possible. It, 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 it kind of feels, I don't know if this is appropriate way of describing it, it kind of feels to make sure the policies you put in place uh, can breathe because they've got to adapt, haven't they? We don't we don't know what, what next social media tool is going to hit the organization either um, you know, through the millennials that have just joined and are all using it, um, or, or whether it's been brought in through the IT department, you know, in a governed uh, kind of fashion. But you've got to make sure the policies are broad enough and flexible enough to, to I guess, incorporate uh, any any new technologies that are coming at you within within reason. That's that's helpful. Okay, Kate. Yeah. I would, I would just like to add to that. Um, I think it's really important too that companies take a look at their third party risk management processes. When we yeah. talk about yeah. tools coming into these environments. Um, what are you doing for due diligence? Are you holding these companies accountable? Do you have the appropriate clauses in your contracts to protect not only your your company but your customers as well that you know there's a lot of um, reliance on third party suppliers out there and that's really where you can you know find big gaps in, in what you would expect. So, you know, third party audits, you know, going in and looking at um, their policies, procedures, getting copies of their compliance audits, like an ISO certificate or a SOC 2 report, which gives a little bit more information, um, would be really helpful. There's a lot of things and uh, tools and companies out there that can help you do your due diligence on, on those uh, third parties. And I think that's really important as well. That's, no, that's uh, data transfer. Point. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this this kind of plays a little bit to that. Uh, pri privacy uh, regulations obviously changing so quickly, aren't they? I mean, uh, just a few years ago, um, I don't know if we even used the term privacy <laughs> regulations. Uh, I, I'm trying to think when it when it first came up, um, but it's not that uh, that long ago. Uh, certainly, in the in the kind of generic sense, um, how can organisations ensure they're ready for the the inevitable regulatory change is going to keep hitting hitting them in in the coming uh, you know weeks months years um yeah and, and i guess a second part of that question what, what do you think is going to come next from regulators and uh from a litigious point of view and uh, and even the technologies that will, will drive some of that so anybody want to have a, a first go at that please I think it's really important to keep your eye on the horizon and, and, and having an ear on the ground to what's what's going on, you know, pay attention to the news, get, sign up for journals um, that would, you know, send you the information on like what's what's going in front of different governments all over the world and the, or well, in the jurisdictions that you work in, of course. Um, and then prepare to to meet those those emerging risks with action. You, you can't just note that you have, oh, hey, you know, there's this thing coming called GDPR. And I mean, I'm just going to watch it. No, you should prepare yourself and start talking to your management team and start talking to the people that are boots on ground about what implications that will have to your organization. And then, of course, you know, as as these laws change, the technologies that support them will change to meet those needs because they know there's a market there for it. If it's a law or an act, um, uh, whether it's, you know, in the United States or, or abroad, companies need to, to quickly shift and adjust to that. And yeah. then, in my opinion, what I think would be great to have happen, and it would be a, a federal US law that would protect privacy. I mean, all those 50 states and then, you know, California is at the, the leading front of, of change in this area for us. And then, you know, companies dealing with GDPR and then Brazil. I think we should have a common baseline here in the US. Hey, um, Taylor, let's just have a global one. Let's just be done with it. Let's have a really yes, high bar, one that, global. That would be um, so great, but that takes so much it. cooperation. <laughs> so so uh, my, my dear panel, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shortchange uh, my your, your colleagues there, Kayla, for, for a close up here. And and so with uh, with maybe just twenty seconds each, what well, maybe highlight what you'd like the audience to take away from this session with one or one or two um, suggestions. Uh, who would like to go first? Takeaways. I'll just jump in real quick and just say, you know, just don't assume people um, know what they need to know. Um, you know, engage everyone the same way across the board. If they're receiving information they already knew, it will serve as a great reminder that will help incorporate that guidance um, and that mindset into their day to day. So keep talking to everyone. Great. Yeah, and to to Kayla's last point, I think the the thing that is the biggest takeaway is that privacy laws are always going to change. And at least for right now in the US, we don't have any sort of, you know, global t sort of guidelines. If you prepare your data as if you are responding to the most strict privacy law that possibly could be made, you will be ahead of every other company and able to respond no matter what law comes up. And so taking that, again, I, I like to go back to that all hazards approach that, that we learn in emergency management. If you take that approach with your data and protecting it, you'll be fine through most situations. That's it, Kayla. Yep, I, I would say I'd like you to take away, um, don't be afraid to pull the rug back. Take a look at what's going on and really invest in the, the you know, the the good hygiene practices to, to start to identify these things and go talk to management about how this could be a return on investment. Yes, it might cost a bit upfront, but in the long run, it's really going to pay off leaps and bounds. It will help you um, from access recertification, from investigations, you can monitor a network. Um, monitor all your networks and all of your, you know, um, your data out there. It will really help with the overall security hygiene of the organization if you do invest in it upfront. That's great. So, uh, ladies, thank you very much for your, your time today and our audience. So uh, I'm going to just recap the, the three things there. So education, education, education. Um, and uh, well, there's three things. Uh, that wasn't the intention. Um, I think uh, all, hazards, all hazards approach is really, really nice. Um, bring the organization in, show the benefits, and that's obviously part of the whole education thing. And uh, my last uh, last uh, line to leave with you all is uh, the email of shame. Um, I'm going to go and look at uh, 
implementing that. Thank you very much, everybody.